this is our smoke alarm installation and inspection training with Miss Angie Grigg with NC BAM. Uh, so I'm going to share just uh, briefly a little bit about this program. I'm going to share my screen from an association level uh, and then we'll um, get started here. Let me go to our website. And if you go to our website, ports association.org and click on mobilize it will show a, a screen for the smoke alarm or you can go directly to the smoke alarm pages <clears throat> linked here and i'll put these links in the uh, youtube video as well but i'm just going to show you really quickly this is a neat little partnership between our churches nc bam and the watauga county fire marshal's office and here is just really quickly a list of things that you can do uh, to partner with your local fire department in this smoke alarm installation uh, and inspection ministry. So notice here, um, you can work with your fire department and any training needs that they have in regard to this. You can encourage them to watch this training or um, just come alongside them in any way in providing possibly a meal for them to, to do uh, this training with, or even just do an appreciation meal, period. Just let them know that you appreciate them. Uh, Angie, can you see what I'm showing right here on your screen? I can. Okay, very yes. good. So uh, the other thing that you can do is if, if the, if the uh, department will allow you to, which most will uh, in our area, to send volunteers along with the firemen to do the inspection of the smoke alarm. Now, granted, you're gonna, the fire department has a referral list at this point of those who have reached out to us and said they would like to have their smoke alarm uh, inspected. So that's where they're getting getting that uh, information from. But I know like the, uh, the other night at our in-person training, one, um, fire chief that was there said he would really appreciate the help of having an additional person with them. They could probably have one person during the day that could go check on that, but having another person from the church would really help them. So just keep that in mind and let them know that you're willing to do that. Uh, also, you may want to make gift bags for the residents uh, that, that you're going to with information about your church or even reach out to the churches that are around you and include a whole bag of uh, information about all of them, but just a nice little gift to let them know that, you know, you, um, you love them and that you're, you're here to help them in any way that they can. And I know that they would greatly appreciate that. Also, you can get additional information from the North Carolina Baptist Aging Ministry about home safety inspections and other ways that you can serve them as well. So uh, just those are just a few ways that you can partner uh, with your local fire department in this great ministry. And keep in mind what this does, it's not about a smoke alarm, even though smoke alarms save lives and we, we know that. Uh, but this is an opportunity for you to minister to someone in your community. I mean, these, these are tools. This is, this is a tool for you to uh, show someone that you care about them. Uh, so with that being said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to let Angie uh, share hers. And she's going to go through the entire training. Uh, and then again, we'll have some links in this uh, video that you'll be able to access some of these forms that she's going to uh, discuss and some other information. So Angie, go ahead. Thank you so much, Wesley, and thank you for this opportunity. I think we're going to have a wonderful partnership and be able to help a lot of senior adults and other people in the community with the uh, alarm installation. So we're going to go through this briefly and try to cover all the important details. Uh, we're not doing this because we don't think that you know how to put up a smoke alarm, but we have to meet the FEMA guidelines for the smoke alarms because they were, um, we did get these uh, alarms and other uh, tools for um, from FEMA through a grant. So we do have to follow guidelines. So if you don't know about North Carolina Baptist Aging Ministry, we are a ministry that helps senior adults across North Carolina 65 and above. You do not have to be Baptist. You do not even have to be Christian. We just help any senior adults to help them still stay safer in their homes. So we do have a call center. People can call and we find resources for them across the state. So that's just a little bit about us. You can find more about us on the uh, internet at ncbam.org. 
So for this grant, we got smoke alarms, 10-year lithium smoke alarms. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Some carbon monoxide alarms, some bed shaker alarms for those that may be deaf and hard of hearing. We'd have a limited number of those. Educational materials and then some and safety incentives for the senior adults. We do have a few grant requirements. We have to install these alarms in homes of adults 65 and above. Um, they need to be installed by train installers that are 18 years old. Now, we don't mind if you've got your mission, your youth mission group there helping you, if they're actually even there putting the alarms up, but they must be there with a trained installer to make sure that they're being put up correctly. We have to provide some fire prevention tips to the residents. They just don't want us going in there, putting up alarms and not educating them a little bit. So we've got eight safety tips that we're going to cover. And one thing that we request back for the smoke alarms is to submit the installation form. And I believe Wesley's going to attach that to this, um, that where you can get that as well. And you can print that out and follow along as well. This is the reason that we are focusing on our senior adults. They are two times greater risk of dying in a, in a house fire when they're 65. When they're 85 and over, three to four times more likely to die in a fire. And this is why we really want to protect our, our precious senior adults, make sure that they're staying safe in their homes. So here are the eight key fire prevention messages for older adults. We will Angie, be if you could scroll, if you could scroll down or uh, advance the slide, I know you're you're probably not in presentation mode, but I don't see the slide that you're actually referring oh. to. I can see. Yeah, there we go. Now we're rolling. OK. All right. I had it in presentation mode. OK, so um, the eight key fire prevention messages, we will be giving these to you in a little handout. So you'll have this information when you're talking to the senior adult. So the number one cause of fires in the home, it, oh, excuse me, fire deaths in the home is smoking. So if someone is in their home and they smoke, talk to them about going outside if you smoke, it's safer to go outside. If you're smoking, have a deep, sturdy ashtray so that this cigarette will stay in the ashtray and not flip out. And make sure that you wet the cigarette butts and ashes before throwing them out. A lot of firefighters can tell you that's how a lot of fires start is um, tossing them out in the trash can. They thought, well, it's been sitting there for two hours. Throw them in the trash can and it still can ignite. Never smoke in bed. A lot of people or in your recliner when you're laid back in the recliner and they're smoking and that cigarette will fall out. And one thing that we're seeing a lot of is smoking with medical oxygen. And people forget that um, oxygen helps build a fire, helps that fire get really started. And when you're on medical oxygen, it's not only coming through the little cannula, but it's also um, filling your hair full of oxygen, your clothes, the curtains, everything is getting saturated with oxygen. And you may not have started a fire yet, but the chances are getting greater and greater whenever you smoke with using oxygen. So leave the oxygen inside, go outside to smoke your cigarette. We know that we have a lot of space heaters <clears throat> and want to make sure that we give our space heaters space, keep heaters at least three feet away from anything that can burn, including the, uh, the people themselves. A lot of times they'll get too close to it because they feel so cold and they need to make sure that they're staying three feet away as well. And make sure that when you leave the house or when you go to bed at night that you unplug the heaters. And you might wanna make sure that you've got one of those space heaters that if it tip, tip, tips over, that it has a tilt switch, that it tips over, it goes off automatically. Some of your older heaters don't do that. So it's another safety feature that's good to have on your space heater. Number three, this is the number one reason for fires in the home, not fire deaths, but for fires, leaving food cooking unattended. So don't leave your cooking unattended. Don't walk away from your food. It's so easy to get distracted. You have a pot of beans cooking and to go out to the door and forget about it or get on the phone. So carry something. If you carry your spoon, carry a spoon out and keep that in your hand if you're leaving the kitchen because that will keep reminding me, oh, I've got something cooking. Have a timer on. Um, make sure that if you are walking away that you've got some way to notify you that you've got cooking so you don't 
forget that. Wear short or form-fitting sleeves so you don't drag it through your food or drag it across the um, eye and burn yourself. And as senior adults, our skin, we burn easier. We have thinner skin. So you need to have oven mitts that will come on up to your elbow if you can get those. So when you're reaching into the oven, not to burn yourself. And remember, if your food catches on fire, slide a lid over it, turn off the burner and wait for that fire to go out because you've taken away the oxygen. So many people are burnt when they take that pan, try to go to the sink and it splashes on them or the flames catch them or they burn their pets or grandchildren. So remind them the best thing to do, cover it up, turn off the eye. And don't cook if you're drowsy, um, maybe alcohol or medication as well, but if you're just sleepy, don't cook at those times because it's so easy to start something, sit down and fall asleep. So message number four is stop, drop and roll. The kids hear about this all the time in school, but there's something senior adults need to hear about as well. They may not have heard this. So let them know what to do if their clothes catch on fire. They need to stop, get down on the ground, cover up their face and roll back and forth until they put out the fire. If they do have a burn, they need to cool that burn for three to five minutes. Don't use any other of these um, other things that you've heard in your life, you know, uh, mayonnaise or anything else put on there. Cool, cool water, not cold water, not ice water, not warm water, cool water for three to five minutes. And that's a long time, but make sure that you do that and to make sure you get medical help right away because as senior adults, these burns are more prone to infection. Again, stay in the kitchen when you're frying food. And oh, I went backwards. We don't do that again. Number five, smoke alarms save lives. And that's one of the big things that we're doing is trying to get smoke alarms, working smoke alarms in the home of senior adults. We'll talk about how you want them on every level of the home, each bedroom, outside of each sleeping room. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. If you have are in a home where they have interconnected alarms, that is your best option of overall of any smoke alarms. Because if one goes off in one bedroom, it's gonna go off in all the rooms. So that's the kind of alarm that is the best. If, if you've got them, that's what you wanna stick with. Make sure everyone can hear the smoke alarms. If you don't have smoke alarms in one of the bedrooms, chances are they're not gonna be able to hear them. So we wanna make sure everyone can hear the alarms that's living in the home. And you still need to test your smoke alarms once a month even with these 10 year lithium alarms, you still need to test, make sure that they're operating. Number six, plan and practice escape from fire. Talk to the senior adults about having two ways out of the home, knowing two ways out of each room and practicing these, making sure that the windows and the doors open easily, that you don't have a lot of stuff stacked in front of it. You think, oh, I'll go out this back way, but it's, it's blocked with boxes in an emergency, you're not gonna be able to get out quickly. Make sure that the windows aren't paid and shut if that's their second way out. And to make sure that they understand when the alarm goes off, they need to get out and stay out. And to practice this, someone can press down the smoke alarm and practice how long it takes for everyone to get out of the home and make sure that they're getting out safely and try to make that goal of getting out within two minutes because fire is fast and it burns quickly. And one thing you want to do is with your escape plan is to have a meeting place, some place where the whole family knows you'll be. It could be out in the woodshed. It could be in the garage, some place that you know you'll be safe from the away from the fire. But the family all knows that that's where the gathering place is. Number seven, know your local emergency number. And in Watauga County, it's 911. But in a panic, it's very easy to forget. You would think 911 is the simplest thing to forget, but you would be surprised how many will dial 919 or 411 or 211. Suddenly, when you're in a panic, it's easy to forget. So write 911 on the phone or have an instant um, dial that you can dial that one number to get that. Make sure that you get out of the home if you have a fire to get out of the home first and then call 911. And then 
One more thing that you wanna tell your senior adults is to plan their escape around their abilities. If you see that they're living upstairs and they're having a hard time getting down the stairs and out, you might wanna say, hey, is there a bedroom downstairs that you could move out, out quicker and be able to get out if you needed to. But some other things you might wanna have in the bedroom is have a telephone in case they're not able to get out, have a flashlight, um, list of medications in case you need anything that you might need quickly to get up and go, your walker, your scooter, glasses, anything like that. So those are the eight messages. And like I said, we'll have you some tear off sheets. So you'll have that information to share with the senior adults when you visit their home. So let's talk a little bit about the smoke alarm. The smoke alarms that we've got are the kit of code one. The batteries are made to last at least 10 years and they have a sealed unit that prevents the removal of batteries. As firefighters know that a lot of times you'll go in and did the smoke alarm go off? Well, they don't know. And we'll check it and the batteries have been pulled out, maybe for a toy at Christmas or just because you had some nuisance alarms. So you just pulled the battery out so it wouldn't keep going off. And these alarms, you cannot remove the battery. If you remove the battery, you destroy both the battery and the alarm. So let the, uh, let the occupant know that this one, you cannot take the battery out, but it does have a smart hush button. Right next to the test button is the smart hush button. If you burn some toast and you know it's just toast and it set off the alarm, you can press that button and it will silence the alarm for eight minutes. Now it will not silence if it's heavy smoke but it will silence for the, the newest sense alarm if it's just light smoke or the steam in the kitchen has set it off. So you can do it that for eight minutes. To install these alarms is very simple. There's a mounting bracket and you'll take that bracket and you'll mount it to the ceiling. You just mark the holes, you drill your holes with the drill bit. And if you have sheet rocks, you wanna use your sheet rock anchors that come with the uh, alarms. And then you're just going to secure that mounting bracket to the ceiling with the mounting screws. Just make sure that's very secure because that's what's holding the alarm up. Very simple. And then to activate the alarm, you basically take that on there and you're going to rotate it clockwise until you hear a little beep. It's activated from that point on. That means from that point on, it should be good for 10 years. Um, it's activated at that point. One thing you might want to do before you put it on there is write the date on the back, just so we have an idea of when it was installed. And once it is, you still want to test the alarm. So you're going to push the test button, hold it for five seconds, and wait till you get that alarm sound. If there's a case, and we've not had one yet, but with all technology, I try to give this warning. If you test it, hold it for five seconds, it doesn't work, continue holding it. If it just will not activate, will not work, take that alarm down and put another one up in that, on that bracket and return the one that doesn't work to us. Like I said, we've not had one any problems, but just let us know if there is ever is a, a problem with one. Where we want to place the alarms is to make sure that everyone in the home can hear the alarms. So you're going to have them outside the sleeping area. You've got a hallway, go into the bedrooms, have an alarm outside of that, outside the sleeping areas. You want one in each bedroom where someone is sleeping. Now, if they've got a six bedroom house and they're only using one bedroom, you don't have to have alarms in every bedroom. But if, there are, if they're using it for a sleeping room, definitely want to have smoke alarms there. If they're sleeping in the kitchen, uh, excuse me, in the living room or the den, you want to put one in there where they're sleeping as well have one on each level of the home and do include the basement. So it's just not one a smoke alarm that you'll be putting in there. You, you, the average is around three to four smoke alarms. These are the areas we want you to avoid, partly because you don't have the deaths from fires in these areas um, and because you're gonna have a lot of nuisance alarms. You're gonna be constantly going off. The garage, because of the vehicles, the kitchens, smoke, uh, smoke and steam bathrooms because of the steam and attics unless it's being slept in but attics it gets so hot you have a thermal imbalance the heat doesn't get up to the smoke alarms so we want to avoid that area 
And in the red, it says, watch the, um, putting them near windows, doors, anywhere there might be a draft that might push the air away from the smoke alarm so that the smoke can't get to the alarm. So watch for anything that might interfere with that operation. Now this slide right here is the one reason I want everybody to be sure to pay attention because this is the one thing that some people may not know is where to place the alarm on the ceiling. See the corner, it says acceptable here, never here. There's a four inch space from the wall and down from the ceiling that we don't want that smoke alarm to be installed. We don't want any part of that alarm in that area. And the reason is smoke goes straight up and then it starts curls, curling back down. It gets, it doesn't get in that void. Eventually it will, but at first when you need to have that to be alerted about the smoke, you don't want it in, up in those corners. So four inches out from the wall, four inches down from the ceiling, never there, okay? Also, if you look over on the right, you'll see a maximum of 12 inches. If we have to put one on the wall, you don't want to come down more than 12 inches. The bottom of your smoke alarm should not come past that 12 inch mark. Come down at least four inches, not more than 12. That will be on the test later. Just kidding, there's no test. This is another um, just areas it shows you not in that four inch area. If you got a peak area, stay out of that peak area. If you have a slope, same thing, that peak area want to avoid. One more spot to avoid. In some mobile homes, and we'll have a lot of these around here, older than 1978, 79, there's very little ins insulation, if any. So when there's little insulation, what you're going to have is a lot of heat in the, in the ceiling area. And for smoke to go up, it's going to cr uh, create a thermal imbalance. It won't allow that smoke to get all the way up to the smoke alarms. So, and also on the side walls, exterior side walls, it's going to be very hot. So in this case, you want to install the smoke alarms interior wall at least four inches down, not more than 12. And that will help when we have the little to no insul insulation in the homes. Carbon monoxide is something else that we want to address. It's a gas that can kill quickly. It's called the silent killer. It causes flu-like symptoms. It can be very dangerous and come on very quickly. And so whenever you have fossil fuel burning appliances in the home, we need to also install carbon monoxide alarms. So your fossil fuel burning appliances, don't let that confuse you. That's your wood stove, that's your gas heaters, that's your gas logs, uh, fireplaces, um, gas stoves. If you have an attached garage, all of these places are gonna need um, carbon monoxide alarm. So we have the Kitta carbon monoxide alarm. You actually plug it in, it's AC powered, but it has battery backup. And these you can just plug in anywhere. We say, we suggest between the heat source and the bedroom, somewhere between there is where you want to plug this uh, kit alarm in. And make sure that it is at least three feet away from any fuel burning appliances. You don't wanna have it too close to the heater or any appliances that are putting off any carbon monoxide. So when you're getting ready to go do your smoke alarm installs, just a reminder that these, all of these equipment that you need, I pretty much found for my home. Uh, we'll give you the smoke alarms and the CO alarms. If you could get a step ladder, I just use my kitchen ladder and that usually works in most cases. I get a cordless drill with a 3 16th drill bit and a Phillips bit. I actually have two cordless drills, one with the drill bit, one with the Phillips bit, so I just don't have to change them out, but that's up to you. Um, hammer and screwdriver if you have any trouble getting the, uh, the drill, the um, screws in, but I rarely ever use those. Safety glasses, so when you're uh, screwing into sheetrock, and have a clipboard with your pens, your insulation form, and education material, and then have some hand sanitizers because some areas you need to clean up afterwards. And one thing I didn't mention is this, we've attached the guidelines and it has all of this information listed. 
So when you go to visit homes, a lot of the homes, you may know them, but if not, you want to try to call in advance if it's possible. The reason is senior adults are, are the focus of a lot of scammers and they don't know who to trust and we don't want their opening the door to just anybody. So call in advance, tell them that you'll be coming, you'll have on vest, you'll have on the church shirts, you'll have your ID, some way for them to know that it's you and not just a scammer trying to get into their home. Try to go in pairs of two or more because it's a lot to do, educating them and installing the alarm and it's safer that way for you and for the senior adult. Identify yourself, make sure they know who you are. Watch for any hazards. Some of these homes you may be going to may have loose steps, uh, places that you could fall through the porch, might have little big, little bitty dogs or big dogs. You want to watch out for them. And when you're in the home, avoid um, going, especially if you're in pairs and one of you is talking to the resident, avoid going into other rooms without the senior dog going along with you, because that way, you know, with dementia or just forgetfulness, they may lose something and think that you might have taken it. So go together so everybody knows what's going on. You want to, once you install the alarm, you want to share with the occupant how to test the alarms. Make sure that they understand how to test them monthly and how to do it safely. We don't want them getting up on stairs to show them how they can test it with a broom handle or a mop handle and how to, um, at least give it a cleaning instruction at least once a year, try to do a little vacuum, a little clean cloth because spider webs can get in there and um, can set up the alarm off. If you go into a home, a lot of the referrals we have, they may have existing alarms. So we want to check the date on alarm. We're finding out that this is an unbelievable number, but more than 80% of the homes we visit have alarms over 10 years of age. I want y'all to check your alarms tonight. If they're over 10 years of age, it's time to replace them and automatically replace any that are 10 years of age. If you take it down and you can't find a date on it, it's older than 10 years old. If it's yellow or beige, smoke alarms don't come in that shades, they come in white, so that's getting too old. So you wanna go ahead and replace those as well. And if you have an alarm that say it's only three or four years old, still go ahead and test the alarm, make sure it's working, um, replace it immediately if it's not responding properly. And then say it's just a couple years old, make sure that they know that it, if it's one that you just change the battery, make sure that they know that they need to change the battery if it's over a year old. And that's in the existing ones, because remember the ones we're giving you, the batteries can't be changed. So this is the form. This is the only thing that we request back from you when you visit a home and install smoke alarms. You only need to do one form for each home that you visit. The top half is the, the customer or excuse me, the occupant can fill that part out and then you fill out the bottom half. And all you're telling us is how many existing alarms they had, how many alarms were over 10 years of age, then please write down how many new alarms you installed. Then check the box if you installed a carbon monoxide alarm. And normally we only install one CO alarm, but if you find that there's a need, write the number next to that. That'd be fine if you find that you do need to have more than one. And then just put the number of how many people uh, were educated and then um, check yes or no. Hopefully you'll check yes that you provided educational materials. We're going to have you those tear off sheets that you can give to them and go over with them. So hopefully you'll check yes and that you educated them. In the notes section is a good place. If you find someone that you installed the alarm and they cannot hear it, their um, possibility they need the deaf and hard of hearing alarm or say they did not want smoke alarms put in their bedroom or some note that is a good place to put the notes there and we do read the notes we'll follow up on that if we see that you feel like you need a deaf and hard of hearing alarm we'll follow up with you on that and then just print your name and your organization who, who you're from this is all we request in return for for these alarms. And these alarms are about $13 each. You can put up as many alarms as you need. So it's a very little 
request back for what, what they're getting. So the, as long as we keep these forms coming back, we'll keep alarms coming, providing alarms to you as long as the alarms last. So to get started, I'm gonna turn this back over to Wesley because he is doing a wonderful job of engineering and putting this all together. Don't be anxious about doing this. It's like he said, this is a great, it's a gateway and getting out and, and getting to know community members, helping people that need help and also letting them know about you and your church. So I am going to stop sharing at this point and let Wesley talk about how he is going to Get it started. <laughs> thank, thank you, Angie. Um, so we, we do already have uh, the referral list from the community. Uh, we did a, a press release back in January. And so we do have uh, some of those already. The churches and fire departments in the communities and where those um, people live have been contacted. However, if this is a ministry that your church is interested in getting involved in, um, for your church members, uh, or even if we receive um, more referrals moving forward, uh, we would be more than happy to share those referrals with you. And again, uh, just in general, doing this ministry for the people in your church, uh, for the shut-ins, for the, you know, the homebound, or again, uh, anybody 65 and over. But I want to make a note, though, that if you encounter somebody in your community or somebody on this referral list doesn't meet the threshold for the 65 and over, then we would encourage you to either work with your local fire department and getting the uh, that homeowner a um, a smoke alarm or maybe even buy one yourself for them. I mean, I think it's a small monetary investment to let them know that you care about them. I mean, that's basically what you're saying is that, you know, you would you would want them to sleep well tonight knowing that they have a working smoke alarm that will wake them up if there happens to be some type of fire emergency. Uh, so that that is that's a great peace of mind. And again, like Angie said, this is a great great, great opportunity for you to uh, get out into the community. You know, one of the one of the things that we think about is when you show up at somebody's door, you know, obviously you can prayer walk and I encourage you to prayer walk and, and um, say, hey, look, can we pray for you? But if you show up with batteries and smoke alarms, you know, to say, hey, look, we'd, we'd love to, to be able to check your smoke alarm or to change your smoke alarm batteries. I, I think that's neat. Uh, but I also want to keep in mind too, that initially when we started this, that we uh, had told the community that we would not solicit in any way, that we would work off of this referral. Uh, so, you know, we're going to do that for at least, uh, you know, the next three to six months, work off of these referrals. But at a later time, if, you know, you decide to get out in your community with this uh, ministry, it would be a great opportunity. So just keep that in mind. All these are tools and um, what we, as Angie said, gateways into relationships with those in our community. And I find more and more and more that churches are surprised when they encounter someone in their community that they don't know, uh, particularly here in Watauga County. You know, it it is what it is in the fact that we have some new folks that have moved into town uh, and things aren't like they were 20 years ago. Uh, so there are a lot of people in your community that you have you don't know. So this is a great way to get to know them. But thank you, Angie. Do you have anything else to say as we kind of close this up today? No, I think you wrapped it up good. And I'm looking, I'm anxious to work with anybody who wants to get involved in the ministry. Well, thank you again so much. And again, reach out to myself or Angie. Our contact information will be in the information uh, part of this uh, video block. So, uh, Reach out to us if you have any additional questions, have any problems finding forms or any of that kind of stuff. Just let us know.